My name is Sherry Guess, and this is the Heavily Meddled Podcast. On this podcast, I interview patients, medical professionals, and industry insiders, having important discussions regarding the all too commonly experienced but lesser identified symptoms of hypersensitivity to metals contained in implanted medical and dental hardware, diet, and environments. These metals often cause a variety of dysfunctional immune responses, chronic pain, and other syndromes that fly under the radar of most patients and physicians. During these interviews, the patients and I discuss ideas for managing symptoms, share personal lifestyle modifications, and talk about how to advocate with and educate providers pre- and post-surgery, along with options found for implant removal and the how-to of adverse event reporting. This podcast does not give medical advice. From time to time, I may interview medical professionals that render personal opinions you can use to follow up with your individual provider. Let's roll. Hello, metalheads, and welcome to the jungle. Welcome back to this edition of the Heavily Metaled Podcast. Today, we have our special guest, Dr. Chris Cottrell, TikTok legend, surgeon, and all around exciting person to have on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you for coming. No, thanks for having me. Uh, It's kind of exciting. I I love this medium. and I love getting out and talking to people that don't otherwise have access. So yeah, it's great. Awesome. So I don't have a prepared bio or anything. So I'm going to start with letting you tell us about your background, your family, your hobbies, surgical specialties, and then we're going to talk about TikTok. Okay. (laughs) Um, I grew up in mostly San Antonio and went to Texas Tech undergrad. So wreck them, guns up. My undergrad is actually in business, believe it or not. After business school, I went to medical school and that had always been the plan. It wasn't like I changed plans. I just had the idea that I would eventually want to practice. So I wanted the business background. I went to medical school also at Texas Tech. And then I did my training in Denver at Exemplus St. Joseph Hospital, which is a private program, but closely associated with the University of Colorado. So I did a lot of my training there as well. And then I started in North Platte, Nebraska, which is halfway between Denver and Omaha. I came down here after about a year and a half because rural surgery and the dynamics around that weren't where I wanted to be. So I've been here in the Dallas area since 2005. Awesome. You wanted to be a surgeon from the get-go? In medicine? Uh, No. It's one of those things where with medical training, you get exposed to these different rotations. And up until the start of when we do rotations and actually start to see patients and experience what the specialty actually is, not what our perception is before medical school, I kind of want to do neurology and the nervous system fascinated me, still does to a little bit of a degree. Unfortunately, neurology to this day, it's a lot of chronic management which is just not where my personality is. So <laughs> realizing that they're managing a lot of chronic conditions, which I mean, more power to them, I full respect for the field, just not where my mentality is. The surgeons in general, we tend to be find problem, meet patient, identify problem, fix problem, follow up problem, and done. <laughs> and <laughs> move on. <laughs> yeah. We take an acute problem or even a chronic problem affects some sort of treatment on it and then do that. So that's just where my uh, mentality is. And then during rotations in surgery, it was just an instant click. Once I actually did that 12 week rotation, there was no doubt in my mind after that, even trauma, which isn't my favorite anymore, but back then it was taking those acutely injured patients and helping them simple stuff like gallbladders and acute gallbladder disease and appendectomies and things that are easy to identify, easy to fix surgically. I mean, there's training, obviously, but the the patient gets better. It's pretty gratifying. So I think that's where my mentality was. It was a no-brainer once I got actually exposed to it. So what kind of hobbies do we have? Hobbies? Well, you can see I'm burnt, so I was in the pool all day. That's a big one. Um, thousand degrees down here. Yeah, we like to do that, my wife and I. And then... Computers, just in general, and media in general, that'll kind of bridge into when we talk about TikTok a little bit, just media creation. I'm sort of an amateur graphic designer. And so taking videos and and making them and editing them and adding things to them, as well as with pictures and stuff like that. I love doing that kind of thing. When my daughter was uh, in drill team, 
I was the sort of unofficial photographer slash videographer and creating some of those videos was pretty fun. Taking it from just shooting it with your camera to trying to shoot a couple different cameras at the same time and then editing those together, it, it got to be actually some production value. So it was kind of fun. And that then led into some of the other stuff that uh, I do with the practice. Cool. And wife and how many kids? One wife. <laughs> and, I didn't ask how many wives. Wife. I said, how many kids? <laughs> two daughters, age 18 and 16. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of estrogen. More power to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't so change it for the world. I believe it. So TikTok following, you have over 11,000 followers and over half a million likes. How did you do that? <laughs> Uh, time and patience and luck. I think I have a team that helps me with that. And there's a guy, he actually comes out from LA and we shoot these things. And then he sort of runs the the page. It started out with Facebook and Instagram, uh, kind of thinking that's where the medical market would be. And for a long time that did okay. Right. In terms of getting patients the message and then ideally getting them to want to see me and, and get something taken care of. Uh, That's the ultimate goal. It was okay, right? And then he's like, you need to do TikTok. And I I knew what TikTok was just basically because of my (laughs) daughters being young. And I looked at it, trying to keep them safe, making sure that they weren't seeing stuff they didn't need to be seeing or that I didn't want them to see. And I wasn't a big fan. I was like, I don't do makeup tutorials. I'm not a dancer. So I don't know what I'm going to bring to the audience. And as it's turned out, TikTok's been way more successful with regards to getting patients a message and then actually getting patients to to come and see me. So, yeah, he said, we need to branch out on the TikTok. And so then he started shooting more vertical stuff like TikTok is. The algorithm is such that people that have medical issues, they tend to see more medical stuff because they tend to pause on it. And that's how the algorithm works. And the algorithm is much more powerful. Now, politically, I can't always say that I'm 100% on board with what TikTok's overall message is. But at the same time, I I think like anything used appropriately and used in the right setting and with proper supervision with minors, I I think it can be tremendously powerful. Time is the the big answer. And then for whatever reason, the TikTok audience was growing, growing, getting kind of bigger. And I think I'd gotten to about eight or 900 followers-ish. And then all of a sudden we put out the robot cherry video and Basically, I take the stem off of a cherry with the DaVinci robotic platform and I tie it in a knot. Yeah, oh, you got it up right there. <laughs> yeah. For whatever reason, that thing exploded. I think 6.3 million views on that one video. And so then, okay. obviously, at that That's point, I'm talking impressive. About- that yeah. is impressive. Yeah. I mean, you know, like what, what is the definition of, of viral? And I, I'd have to say that's probably viral. The nice thing about that, though, is that being viewed so many times and it was a relatively short video so a lot of people watched it all the way through and they would send it to their friends and they liked and then and they'd make comments and there was all kinds of funny comments i had to delete a few because there's always going to be trolls i bet i bet yeah but but for the most part that was the big video so i went from those 900 followers to eight or nine thousand and then it's slowly grown from there and so then now instead of everything getting 50 and 100 views now even kind of the meh videos get three or 400 views. And I like that. So it's just expanded the audience. And so medicine entertainment, right? I have this debate with my partner all the time. I don't necessarily want to be the entertaining doc, right? I don't want to be the guy that's dancing and trying to get patients or something like that. But at the same time, I think information that we can give in a hopefully somewhat entertaining way that you know drives a larger audience allows us to help more people. And so I think there's some advantage in doing stuff that is somewhat entertaining. I'm not going to do a makeup tutorial. I'm not going to dance. That's just not who I am. Uh, Although there's actually one video of me dancing with the the corn. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I haven't cracked TikTok yet, but I'm starting just the same way. I just went viral last week on Facebook and started with 200 followers and grew to like 7,000. I have not been able to crack TikTok. It doesn't matter what I post and I'm posting the same stuff. And I think it's good stuff. Today, I had one that finally hit 3,000 views and I think I'm up to 500 followers on TikTok. So y'all go follow me on TikTok, but I haven't cracked TikTok yet, even though I post everywhere. But Facebook loves me today. (laughs) It was a year before that happened. And then with that cherry thing, you know, the funny part is that gets posted into Instagram as well. It did like me on Instagram, right? 
I mean, I think it got three or 400 views on Instagram, maybe a thousand, but like not yeah. that. Great. Isn't it funny how it does that? So what I'm yeah. going to do is stitch your cherry video on TikTok for advertising yeah. the podcast. And then I will use you to grow my TikTok following. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, I've, that's how and it, it can works. Go viral yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. I've not figured out the stitch thing. And videos you think are going to do well and you kind of like do so that they will do well. Like for right. May the 4th, it took me like an hour and a half to build a little tiny Lego set with the robotic platform. We filmed the whole thing. Christian is with Tri Odyssey Productions. He's my guy. And he edited it all together so that it wasn't too long. And I'm thinking, this thing's going to blow up. On May the 4th, a Millennium Falcon and a robot, it's going to be great. And again, it did fine, but like four or 5,000 views. I was like, hmm, interesting. So it's, it's an unknown thing. Well, mine was the weirdest thing. I've been posting all this really cool, really valuable stuff about what's going to kill people with metal allergies. And the post that blows up, your stainless steel water bottle can be making you sick. That's the one that blew up. That is the most random video I've ever posted. Oh, I, I kind of get it, though. I mean, with, with hydro flasks and like all the water Yetis. bottle stuff. I mean, these weird, yeah, right. Weird yep. keyword. And the crazy thing is that I got... Over half a million views. It's, now it's above 600,000 and 500 comments, 8,000 shares. And everybody's like, me too, me too. Oh, I get sick after I drink out of my stainless steel water bottle. And oh, I get hives after I drink out of my stainless steel water bottle. And I'm going, who knew? <laughs> Interesting. Cool. It's very cool. I think as the audience has grown a little bit, it's funny. I get patients from all over. And I do a lot of reflux work, right? We talked about, you asked me surgical specialties, and I don't think I actually ever answered it, but in terms of surgery, robotics is a huge deal for me. I embraced that platform 10, 15 years ago and I haven't turned back. And I've done so many robotic cases. I proctor for the company. I teach other surgeons how to use the robot effectively. So it's something I'm super passionate about. And that goes into the, the anti-reflux work that I do, even some bariatrics. And so that's like my like primary focus. If you look at my TikTok, there's a ton of reflux stuff on there. Yeah. I didn't know um, you did bariatrics. Yeah. Yeah, we just started putting that out. Actually, we just filmed it. I don't think it's out yet. But yeah, we do bariatric surgery. Uh, my partner and I both do. How it all ties to reflux though, right? Because a lot of patients that have had a sleeve end up having pretty significant reflux. And so there's not a lot of options for them because so much of the stomach is gone. So then you kind of have to convert them into like a bypass. And so that's where in treating reflux, now all of a sudden I'm doing bariatric surgery. And okay, great. When we put some of that information out there, then I get questions and I respond. I think that's the other thing is, and I'm sure you do this. I think responding to your questions is a super important thing. When people ask questions, if they're trolling, whatever, but if they're actually asking a question. They're reaching out. That takes a lot of guts, right? I was going to say, I'm impressed. I messaged you on TikTok and you messaged back. That's impressive for a medical professional to do that. I think it's important. I think if you're not doing that, then what the hell are you doing, right? Because then you're just advertising. I think that's maybe not so great. I think if you're actually trying to get information out there and you yeah. can look, I mean, there, there's all kinds of people. Like I thought this lady that we have televisits. I know you may not be close. And she's like, well, I'm in the UK. I'm like, ooh, that's a lot harder. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Good luck. Here's the questions to ask, you know, things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did have a patient from Canada. And that was actually interesting because it was hard in that the televisit app that we use is only available in the United States. So normally we have like through our electronic yeah. medical record, we have this you know, encrypted app or whatever. So it's HIPAA safe and all those things. I had no way to do that with her. So we set up a standard Zoom call so that I could talk to her. So yeah, interesting stuff. Nice. Let's dive into the metal questions because I have an audience that is so thrilled that we have a surgeon on here to talk about metal allergies because the amount of patients sure. that are gaslit over this is like through the roof. So how long have you been removing clips and staples from metal allergy patients? I think it's been about two years. Okay. Two, two and a half. Yeah. How did you get into that? I know you can't like divulge any information, but like, who was your first patient? How did that yeah, happen? Right. What was so, that like? So there was another doctor and I know he does not want his name out there. So I'm going to leave that alone. The people that have researched just probably know who this is anyway. But basically in residency, he did a paper about metal. It wasn't so much allergy as much as metal and clips and other implanted things causing pain, discomfort, and problems. I I don't think it was allergy, but regardless, this was just in residency. So he published this thing and it got a little bit of attention, whatever. 
And then he's just a standard sort of OBGYN physician who does standard good practice of OBGYN. And he and I did develop a bit of a relationship. I helped him with some stuff. He helped me with some stuff. And we got to talking one night while literally we're down in the CAT scanner checking on a patient that he was worried about that he had asked me to consult on. So we're waiting for this woman to get scanned. And he just starts asking me, you know, he's like, hey, you know, would you, how hard is it to take these clips out? And I was like, huh, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't had to do that. But as I was thinking about, it, you know, I was like, robotically, we could do that pretty easily. Um, yeah, I, I think we could do that. And so it was like one of these questions, you're just having a conversation. And he's like, well, would you be interested in seeing patients? And I go, okay, I'm happy to talk. And he just said, I get these phone calls all the time because of this paper that's out there. So people that have done research and are having trouble finding someone, they'll reach out to him. And then he's like, I have nowhere to send them. And so if you want them, then I will send them to you. I was like, okay. And so at the time, I didn't really know how I felt about it, to be completely honest. It was kind of one of those- the fringe uh, maybe thing. Another, yeah, well, fringe thing, but I- I'm not really worried about being fringe, just to be completely honest. It's more about like, I just didn't know how I felt about it, right? I was like, I'm not so sure. The first couple of patients I got from him would be like one every quarter-ish, right? So not a lot to begin with. I had a guy, he had not had any testing done whatsoever. I was able to pull up his entire medical record and he literally had this pain forever. He ends up getting his gallbladder taken out, has clips. Now's convinced the pain he had forever was the clips. And I was looking through the notes. I'm going, this pain's been there. So I wasn't 100% sure. I wanted him to go get tested and get you know some labs drawn. And then he just left and flamed me on the internet, which was amazing. <laughs> I think that was actually the first person I saw. I was like, hmm, maybe that this isn't for so me. Well. <laughs> and then the next patient was extremely just awesome, right? Just kind of someone who was a little bit at her wits end, had been through the process, had contacted surgeons and just wasn't really getting much luck. And she had a bunch of testing done already. She had had allergy testing and the the ortho testing and whatnot, as well as something else. I don't remember what it was, to be honest, because it's been a while. Anyway, she really just wanted these things out. And I'm like, okay, so... I think, and I still do this to this day, we had a long conversation of like, you know, this is not something that's been extremely well studied as to whether there's a metal allergy or not. I think that's getting a little bit better studied, but in terms of do patients improve when you remove the metal? That's the question that unfortunately just, there's not a study that we can pull up and say, these 150 patients had their staples removed and these 150 people didn't have their staples removed and these got better and these didn't. We don't have Maybe that Maybe you're the guy for that study. <laughs> I had the time. We could talk about why that's hard but in a minute. And so we ended up after a little bit of conversation and she was out of town. I don't remember where she was from, but she came in. We robotically took out her gallbladder clips and she got better like immediately. Like she woke up in the recovery room feeling better. And I think that's what I kind of went, Oh, interesting. And then I'm thinking, okay, there's something called placebo effect. Maybe this is just placebo effect, right? Which is possible, yeah, right? I mean, it is. having been a surgeon now for almost 20 years, well, 20 years after being done with training, you see it, right? You can do an operation, a patient will get better for 30 days, almost no matter what you do or sometimes. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe that's it. And so I followed her for a couple of months and the improvement remained. And so I'm like, okay. That's interesting. So then the next patient that came was actually a lady. She was from the Colorado area. And there's a fairly famous respiratory institute, National Jewish Hospital in Denver. And it all kind of makes sense because back before we could treat tuberculosis with antibiotics, we would send patients to low oxygen tension areas, high altitude, so they would do better with tuberculosis, right? So there's actually a fair amount of lung disease that's studied and taught in, in Denver. At least that's where the history is. That kind of stuff interests me. And she had had every test under the sun proving her metal allergy, right? And so for her, it was a no-brainer to take those. And she had rashes and some uticaria and some other things that are really indicative of hypersensitivity reactions. And literally within a week, those were gone. When we did her televisit post-op, I mean, she was literally in tears thanking me. And, you know, doing something that's relatively simple to do 
and making a difference in someone's life from not only making them feel better, but also having them be heard. Because I think that's the other thing is a lot of people that are experiencing this, they feel unheard. They Um, are unheard. (laughs) Yeah. Dismissed, patronized or whatever. Even the couple patients that I haven't operated on for one reason or another, I hope my goal would be that they at least feel hurt and that that this isn't all in their head and that at least someone's listening. I can tell you that having talked to a bunch of patients now with this, there are some you're like, oh yeah, yeah, this makes sense. And there's some where you're like, I don't know (laughs) what what you got going on is a little bit different. Maybe I'm not sure. I think the big fear with surgeons is that they're going to do something that's hurting patients and not helping them. And I appreciate that. I totally understand that. And I think because surgeons aren't taught how to take clips out. This is not part of training. They're not doing it. And so I think what they're convinced is if they take the clip off, that everything's going to bleed or it's going to cause more problems. It's going to help and things like that. And there are some reasonable reasons why we think that. But in practice, the clips are already scarred in. Whatever it was clipping has scarred down and isn't going to really do anything. I had these same concerns the first time we did it. My first patient, we had a lot more conversation about what I would do with this and that and kind of then yeah. followed things up. And in in essence, realistically, you break through a little bit of scar tissue and then you kind of just pop the clip off. It's pretty simple. But there's a patient that's coming your way. I don't think you've talked to her yet. I'm not going to name her. Literally, her surgeon told her that if she had these abdominal clips and staples removed, that she would die. Literally told her she would die. And she's terrified. And we're like, wow. we were all told we would die. We haven't died. I guess you could always die in surgery, but nobody's died that I know of. Unfortunately, any surgery that you do, even the most simple, whether it's a breast augmentation or a lipoma excision, there is a mortality rate with every surgery. So you don't want to take it lightly for sure. But yeah, it's a lot less risk than I think people think that it is. There's riskier locations. For me, the hardest part is making sure you get them all. We take an x-ray beforehand. We try and count them. That count's never right because the clips overlap and you really can't count them per se. And then we take an x-ray afterward to make sure all the metal's gone. And the hard part is when patients have clips that are in locations they didn't think there were clips. I had this actually happen where we had pelvic clips and gallbladder clips. And we took the gallbladder clips, no problem. There was a couple of pelvic clips from the previous pelvic surgery. and then. I'm taking the x-ray. I'm like, okay, there's still like 20 clips. Where are these clips? And sure enough, we ended up opening and looking around, can't find these clips. I'm like, what on earth? And then I look and I realized she's had a tummy tuck. It's like, okay. And so there was a bunch of clips related to the tummy tuck. And so it was a lot more effort, but we ended up having to make little tiny incisions kind of all over to get every individual clip. That was hard, hard, tedious, not hard, hard, if that makes sense. She ended up getting a lot more little tiny incisions than she probably wanted, but I can tell you that she did great, right? She felt much better and we got every single clip. So that's the hard part is getting them and then making sure. And I think there's been one or two other patients where just couldn't find them, just can't find them. Like, where are they? And you do have to reach a point where it's like, okay, by me continuing to look, I can cause harm and I could do the harm that some of these surgeons are talking about where you do something that injures a major artery or vessel where, okay, I I don't want someone to continue to have the clips if that's causing their problem. But at the same time, I obviously don't want to have them bleed badly uh, or risk the blood flow to their leg or something like that. So at some point you do have to call it, but we try not to. I think there needs to be a lot of grace for the surgeons who even do this and entertain this. My theory is I know a few patients that have had clips removed or some were missed but they're dramatically better. So if you get 90% or 85% and you're dramatically better, you can probably live with one or two. So I I think there needs to be some grace to the surgeons and and on behalf of the patients in some of these areas, because the practice of medicine is a practice. It's not perfect. Indeed. And surgeons aren't perfect either. And I, I think one of the things I literally now make sure that I say, you know, sometimes we can't get these for this reason or that reason. We don't want to hurt anyone. Do no harm. That's a pretty basic thing that we are taught and that's hammered into us. But yep. at the same time, you want know, to give it the good college try. So yeah. Um, but it's been extremely rewarding because again, I was not expecting this, especially after my first patient having kind of a, a negative experience. Uh, how many have you done? Would you say? Yeah, you I knew you were going to. I think it's about twenty-five now. Okay. 
Yeah. Still pretty, 20, still pretty early on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They come in spurts, though. It's like yeah. all of a sudden there's one is like, oh gosh, I guess they went away, and then all of a sudden it's like I've done three. And so what, what's funny about these numbers in surgery? If you ask me yeah, how many have you done, and I say twenty, it wouldn't surprise me if it was actually fifty. Um, th- these things happen. I we don't yeah. count really, per se. We we code and we do it, and like yeah. I can have my office uh, staff pull it up as to how many I've done, but. Yeah, I, I truthfully, I don't know. Do you remove any other types of hardware? Or for removal, is it mainly clips and staples at this point? Clips and staples. In terms of general surgery, unfortunately, I have to limit myself to what I at least have some knowledge of, right? So there's orthopedic hardware and stuff that I, I can't deal with. Unfortunately, just not having the training, the, the liability on something like that, it's kind of through the roof, just because I'm not someone that can evaluate an x-ray and say whether a plate or rod or whatever orthopedically could come out and be safe. If an orthopod approached me and said, hey, do you want to help me get these out? Yeah, I'd be down for that. But in terms of me being the one to say, hey, that thing on your radius can come out now, that's unfortunately just over my scope. So for the most part, yeah, clips and staples. The staple lines, unfortunately, there's like hundreds of staples that get placed when you place a staple line into abdominal. And then likewise with clips, clips are so convenient to place in terms of any kind of bleeding. You know, you lift the vessel up, you clip it, you stop the bleeding. It's a very easy thing to do. And so I, I get why they're used, but that, that's typically what I take out. Well, I have more questions on that coming up. Are there locations sure. where you would not be inclined to remove clips and staples? That's a great question. Yes. If you have an nephrectomy, right? So if you take a kidney out, it's pretty common if you have it done laparoscopically, then not uncommonly, they will staple it across the renal artery or renal vein. Those bleed a lot. And to dissect all that out and then tie it off appropriately, I think puts the patient at unnecessary risk, unfortunately. That's a location that would be pretty tough to deal with. Now, when I say that, I wouldn't do it robotically. I I might be persuaded to do it open. We'd have to do a big incision. I'd want all kinds of exposure because we're talking about the big vessels that you can leave from that causes death within a couple of minutes. So that's not something you would mess around with too cavalierly. If it involves major vessels and particularly veins, believe it or not, veins are harder to deal with. Arteries, relatively easy to deal with because you can see where the bleeding's from. Veins just pull up and it's it's kind of hard to stop some of that bleeding sometimes. So if we're dealing with that, then yeah, that would be the thing. There are lymph node dissection surgeries that happen, particularly for ovarian cancer, where they do a lot of dissection up on the aorta itself. It, a lot of times clips get placed. I'd be very careful about doing that robotically as well. Again, I'd consider it open, but I don't think I would do that robotically. Got to be careful in the neck too. Again, big vessels. Again, not that I couldn't get them, not that I wouldn't I was going to ask about but, thyroid clips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a common place. Again, the problem is that problems there are accentuated, right? Bleeding there, bleeding in the neck doesn't go well. It obstructs airways and makes it hard to breathe. Breathing is good as well as there's nerves and stuff like that that can be injured, damaged as you're trying to fight through some of that you would worry about more so than other surgeries. But again, it's about risk management. It's about risk understanding. I say this, and actually this just came out, this video, it's TikTok, what our philosophy is in the practice, and and it always has been for me, is I think of my job as an educator, right? I mean, obviously I'm a surgeon, so that's a technique and, and technical expertise, but I try to make sure that a patient understands what's going on, what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, such that they can make a decision that works for them. For a lot of things we do, that's pretty simple. You have a tiny little fatty tumor in your forearm. I'm going to cut it out. What else do I need to know? How much? I'm going to cut it out. Versus even gallbladder surgery, which we do all the time, it's not super risky, but there's a couple of things you've got to know about. There's a chance of injuring the bile duct. There's a chance of a stone slipping by. These are all things that have consequences and additional procedures that need to be done if there's a problem. And so for a patient to undergo surgery and then not understand those risks, and then all of a sudden now you're dealing with it, that's when people get pissed. Rightfully so, right? You didn't tell me this could happen. I think as long as you can manage those risks. Now, unfortunately, human bodies are funny and you can't necessarily cover everything every time, but you try to. You try to cover as much as you can that makes sense for the procedure. And so- Right. For these clips, depending on where they are, yeah, we'll talk about it. You know, thyroid, okay, I can risk injuring your nerve. That's going to make it hard to talk, maybe hard to swallow. Maybe the the way that you phonate, right, the, the, the loudness of your voice could be diminished in certain scenarios. So, yeah, we, ha- we got to talk about all this stuff. And as long as the patient understands, then I'm good. 
Does that make sense? Makes sense. What are you taught about allergies to metal in medical school? Anything? Very little. Okay. <laughs> very, very little. I think what we learn about in medical school, and granted, I'm a little on the older side. I graduated from med school in 99, and so it has been a little while. This is the kind of stuff that we learn in our second years. That would have been like 97. So we're literally talking about 26 years ago. We learn about allergies, the different types of allergic reactions and what drives them, what causes them, and then what the allergic response looks like and the different types of allergic responses that there are. There's a couple of different kinds. I am not an allergist. So for me to claim any kind of expertise, it's yes. been a while. But basically there's your standard allergy where, you know, seasonal stuff, pollen, and that generates a mast cell reaction that then releases histamine and then you get the runny nose and that's kind of a classic thing. And then there's all these more chronic things that give you things like rashes and bumps and whelps and things like that. And those are kind of the more classic things. And we certainly see that when we talk about metals, at least I have, but is a little bit harder to get a grasp on is this chronic, more ill-defined, I just don't feel good. I'm tired. I have fatigue, pain. And so I think this is part of medicine that is just not understood as well yet. And so they may have a hypersensitivity when you test them, but the symptoms aren't classic necessarily with regards to what we think of as allergic responses being. So I think that's where you got to listen. I think the conversation is simply, okay, you have clips. I am capable of taking those out. They may or may not be hurting you. If you want them out and you understand the risk, then I'm okay taking them out as long as you understand that it might not help. And I've had that conversation at least 25 times now. It almost always helps. I can only think of like two people that it didn't help. Overall, you know, most surgeons, boom, done a couple follow-ups and they never hear from the patient again. And I think this can be a problem in regards to putting in hardware because we know most of the metal allergies I'm aware of are type four delayed hypersensitivity systemic reactions right. that occur six months to a year after surgery when patients aren't necessarily still in communication with their surgeons. And I think the sure. concept of this systemic pain picture with doctors is really hard for them to grasp, but they're not just saying could be, it's possible. They're saying no, can't happen. And I think we have to change the narrative on that because it can and is. And I think you've seen that with the patients you've helped. Yeah. The patient that I wouldn't operate on, it doesn't have to do with the clips or the scenario. It has to do with the interview, right? If I feel like their expectation is not reasonable, I think that's when I get a little more standoffish just because it's, you have to have a realistic thing. And if you can't acknowledge that it might not help, I worry about that a little bit. I guess that's kind of how I measure it. But I think most people are just simply happy to get them out and they feel better. The only yeah. thing is like anything else, I listen. And I, I had a lady that saw me. She was worried about her clips. It turned out she did not have metal clips. She had silicone clips. You would think silicone, it's pretty darn inert. It's hard to imagine allergic response to it. Not impossible, but harder to imagine that. When I talked to her, it was pretty obvious to me that she was just having a what, what sounded like either a retained stone or so something called a sphincter of OD dysfunction, like a kind of a post gallbladder thing that happens. And she just needed to see a GI doc. She needed something else. I think she initially thought clips, but again, I listened <laughs> and I think we identified something that was more helpful for her. So sure. yeah, I, I'm listening key, I guess maybe is the biggest theme, huh? Yeah, for sure. And you're a great listener. I know that. <laughs> and you're a great talker too. <laughs> we Apparently. can stay here all night. I, this might be my favorite interview ever. <laughs> Does insurance fight you on removing clips and staples? No, I've been shocked. Not really. There's a code for metal hypersensitivity. We code things based on an ICD-10, and then it's like foreign body removal is how the case gets booked. The problems I have insurance-wise, because I see patients from all over, is just simply I'm not on their plan. That's the problem I have with insurance, where someone's coming from Utah and has some Utah-specific insurance, and I'm not on that plan, and they can't get it covered and blah, blah, blah. And so that's the only time that we have to start really talking about cash pay. Is cash uh, pay an option? You know, 100%. Is it affordable? You know, affordable is different for everyone, right? I think right. with regards to cash pay, I think we offer a fairly competitive price. I can tell you that, obviously, I don't want to give numbers over the, that's kind of a weird thing to do. But in general, you're talking about less than most major plastic surgery procedures. Above so, 10,000, below 10,000. Below. Below, below. 10,000. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hello. My part, we charge, you know, I think I think a very fair price. The part that I don't have control over is the hospital, anesthesia, and pathology. They have to confirm 
confirm that I actually did it. So the pathology does have to look at them or at least mark that they were there. And then just obviously you have to go to sleep for this. So that's anesthesia and stuff like that. Although they are doing a lot more awake surgeries these days. Uh, that wouldn't be me, but. Unfortunately for robotic surgery, where you have to have your belly filled with air, that's uncomfortable and epidural and spinals. <laughs> that's just, no, nah, you got to go to sleep, unfortunately. <laughs> got it. And now a word from our sponsor. Attention metalheads, are you struggling with skin rashes, joint and systemic pain, or fatigue that just won't go away? Type 4 metal allergy is often overlooked as a culprit in many of today's chronic illnesses. Get to the root of the problem with MELISA testing. MELISA is a scientifically proven and clinically validated test that measures immune reactivity to metal allergens like nickel, cobalt, and titanium. With fast and reliable results, you can get the answers you need to find relief and live a healthier life. Don't let metal allergies control your life any longer. Visit MELISA.org to learn more and schedule your test. Trust us, you'll be glad you did. MELISA a valuable diagnostic tool in medicine. What should a patient do or not do in regards to talking to their doctor or surgeon about suspected metal allergies? That's a great question. I think it's helpful to get tested, right? There's an orthopedic lab that does that. I think they have some insurance issues because you have to pay for that out of pocket. If they can get it tested beforehand, that's helpful. That speeds the process along. It has to be ordered by a physician. We have the ability to do that. We can order it. As we've gotten more into this, we've got the paperwork and stuff, so we can send that off. I think some patients have gotten it reimbursed through their insurance once it comes back. But it's not that company, unfortunately, does not like do it through insurance. So yes. it's not like you just pay copay. That you have to pay the full amount and then recoup it yeah. from your insurance. I, I think that's been variable in terms of success. I'll be honest with you. I don't know that there's a whole lot of advantage of talking to someone who's not willing to listen. So, I mean, you can certainly bring it up to your PCP. And if there happens to be someone in the community, so you don't have to drive or fly across country to see me, then yeah. great. Because I know there's a couple of other surgeons in the country that are doing it. And if you can find someone nearby, great. Your PCP may or may not even be connected. So, Bring it up. If you don't get heard, I guess look elsewhere, I think is the quick answer on that. We talked about this for a second, but your hospital is fantastic. I was there with another patient for a non-related surgery, and they actually asked in pre-op, have you ever had a reaction to jewelry or metal? What the heck? Did you have anything to do with that? I've never heard that in my 30 surgeries plus have I ever been asked one time. No, that's interesting. I, I be honest with you, you're educating me. I didn't know that was asked. Yes. Only hospital ever. No, that's interesting. We see as we do more and more surgery and we do something that makes sense. And then all of a sudden we realize there's an issue, right? So we use a ton of glue, super glue, literally. Derma bond is what it's called. You suture the skin and then you glue it shut. It works great. It's waterproof. Patients can shower the next or the same day. It's a great thing. A certain percentage of the population is allergic to it, right? And unfortunately, when you have that allergy, yeah, you get this gigantic rash, there's not much you can do, right? I mean, it, I've, I've yep. given steroids, I've given Benadryl, eat, eat, tear it off as fast as you can and let the rash run its course. It's about all you can do, I unfortunately. Had my, I had my gallbladder clips out and come home with, you know, I've got the four little robotic incisions. I come home and every single incision has got a welt that yeah. big around it. It was yeah. horrific. Yeah, yeah, I no, was like, it, it, it just seemed like crazy for sure. So now we ask more about that, right? Are you allergic to Durban? Have you been had that before? So yeah, I think as we identify things, we we try and ask questions to avoid these things. Latex, when I first started training, the latex allergy situation was such that we asked about it, but like it was such a pain in the ass, we tried to talk patients out of it. And now that we have so much latex-free equipment, a latex-free case is so easy, we're much better about asking about it. And Latex allergy is a real deal. Trust me. I've seen it cause pretty severe symptoms. You'd, you'd be amazed how many surgery centers that we've talked to personally just won't even implement the asking of the simple question. And there doesn't seem like any rhyme or reason for why that should be. It should be super no, easy. No, no, it's true. Although not, I've seen not places. Not expensive. No, the latex thing, though, I've seen places that literally have a 100% latex-free policy, so they don't ask because they already have a latex-free policy. Yeah. Sometimes they don't ask because they have really taken it more seriously than you think, even though they didn't ask, if that makes sense. <laughs> so if a patient wants to know if they have clips or staples, what's the best test to identify that? Great question. Generally, what we call a KUB, just an abdominal x-ray, is a really good first test. It's not okay. going to tell you location as well, but the clips and staples in general, particularly clips, light up very, very well. 
if you had surgery where you're pretty sure they did something and you don't see something on the KUB or the just abdominal x-ray, then the T-scan. Simply because the resolution is so good and you can tell exactly where they are. If you only had gallbladder surgery, I'd probably start with just the KUB because you're going to be able to see those clips. But if you had some sort of bowel surgery or appendix or you know hysterectomy or something like that, and you're not sure, I would probably go with CT. Does it matter if it's with or without contrast? Without is probably better simply because the contrast lights up white and so do the staples and clips. Like when we were looking for kidney stones or ureter stones, we literally give no contrast so we can see those. If you gave contrast, you wouldn't be able to see them. So yeah, definitely okay. no contrast. Is it difficult or are there any problems with returning clips and staples to patients that want them post-surgery? Yeah, this is something we just answered in the last five or six patients. No, as it turns out, we just have to run through the autoclave so they're sterile. I've had patients that didn't like that because they wanted them analyzed. And I, I understand that. Legally, we have to make sure we don't give something that could be a biohazard to the community. And so like when my dad had his gallbladder out in 1989, they gave him his stones in a cup, right? Right. That's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> my dad used to do these gallbladder cleanses, like home gallbladder cleanses. And he kept them in the freezer and he would show people that came over his gallstones. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we don't do that anymore. Right. So same thing with the clips and stuff. Like I assume the answer was no, but as I've talked to the departments at two different hospitals where I do this, they're fine with it. They just want them to go through the autoclave first. Do you have any interest in documenting some of these cases for the medical literature? Yes. Um, and no. I'd love to do that study. There's several studies that I want to do, particularly with reflux, where my volume is significantly higher. I don't have the time or manpower is the problem, right? So when you look at, if you were to pull up the medical literature, so much of the medical literature is put out by people that are in academia, right? Meaning they are associated with either a medical school or a residency sure. program. So the bulk of that information is gotten or gleaned by residents, medical students, research assistants, grants from whether it be you know NIH or this company or that company. To do all that, it's a lot more complicated than you'd think, right? There's something called an IRB board that every study has to be approved by to make sure that we're not exploiting patients and that we're not some of the horrendous sins of the past in terms of medical studies that have been done aren't repeated. And I support all those things. It's just hard to accomplish as a private practicing surgeon. So if there was a way for me to participate in something like that through a study that's being done somewhere else, yes, I'd be totally glad to contribute my patients as long as they consented, of course. But in terms of me doing a study that's more complicated and just time consuming and unfortunate that I have time for it. I've Interns got, and residents be able to help with something like that? I don't have any, for sure. They okay. absolutely can. Yeah, yeah. The okay. um, medical schools are where those are, right? In yeah. where we are, there's one, two, three programs that have surgical residents. Four. Yeah, four. Make sure I'm not missing one. Yeah, four in the general area. Anyway, yeah, they can do studies, right? For me, Without the support of whether it be a company or some sort of institution, it's just a lot harder than you think it might be. Do you use staples or clips in reflux surgery? And then I'm going to actually combine this with another question. Are there alternatives to clips and staples? And if so, why aren't doctors using them? The the quick answer on the reflux surgery is no. I sew those. So there's no clips, right? Okay. With reflux surgery, there is a mesh that I use to repair the diaphragm and that mesh is dissolvable. So that mesh goes away in two years. So my thinking behind that is if anyone had any kind of reaction to that, two years and it'd be gone and literally gone. Like there's nothing left of it. Your body completely gets rid of it. And when I sew it in, I do sew it in with suture, two different sutures. One dissolves, one does not. To repair something that needs to stay repaired, unfortunately, you have to use a permanent suture. If I use the dissolvable suture, then the repair would only last for as long as the suture lasted. So yeah, you got to yeah. use a permanent suture, but no clips. Why do you think doctors aren't doing surgeries without clips and staples? The nice thing is kind of a two-part answer. It's easier. It's a lot easier. A clip is much, much easier than sewing. So that'd be the traditional answer. Sewing a vessel, particularly when you we convert from open surgery to laparoscopy. With laparoscopy, now we have these sticks where we have good mobility and we can do safe surgery. But in terms of actually tying something down and having it be an effective stopping blood flow or stopping any kind of bile that would leak from a, a duct in the gallbladder, 
much more challenging. And I don't know that it'd be worth the risk of the average patient, particularly if they didn't have a metal allergy. So you look at what's the benefit versus harm. And this is how medicine works in general. Sure. So if, if we take out 100,000 gallbladders every single year, and before laparoscopy, we took those out open, mm -hmm. which was right. a week recovery, sometimes a week in the hospital, and then six weeks until you could really work or function again. And now we change that to a day surgery that people get back to work in a couple of days to a week, right? So that's a big difference. So that's a huge mm -hmm. win for patients. Yeah. Now, because we're using these metal clips that make that much easier and a safer operation than trying to tie it, we have a certain percentage that now we've exposed to a risk that they wouldn't have been exposed to before. So overall, good has been done with problems. So here we are. When you have laparoscopy, clips are important. When we switch to robotics, well, the conversation is a little bit different. First of all, the robotic clips that we use, they're not metal. It's a silicone clip. I meant nylon clip. Nylon is the same stuff we use in suture. Right. In general, that's the clips I'm using these days. I rarely use metal clips anymore, partially because that's robotic surgery and then partially because of my exposure to this. But yeah, the, the nylon clips work great. Why aren't more people using them? More people need to do robotic surgery. I'm passionate about that. Um, right. And then we have to look at the benefit versus the bad. Right. Sure. Do you think informed consent is an issue? Patients not understanding, for example, let's just take cholecystectomy, not understanding that a foreign body is going to be left inside them. Is that an issue? And do, can we overcome that? Yes, particularly for the people that are affected by it. Informed consent is, it's a difficult thing, right? Because we want a patient to understand what could happen to them. And unfortunately, if we look at every single thing that can happen to a patient, we would literally be having to put patients through medical school to get them to make an actually true informed decision. Now, that's the extreme. What can we talk about? There are certain things that by law we have to say. With gallbladder surgery, clips is not one of them. But injury to the common bile duct, retained stone, bile leak, uh, and pancreatitis, the things that we have to divulge to patients. That's required by law. Should we be talking about clips? Probably. I think the more you tell a patient, the better. The question is, where do you draw the line? There's a one in 200,000 chance, which is extremely small. You're better off playing the lottery of having an adverse reaction to anesthesia. Do we talk about that? Or is that for the anesthesiologist to talk about? There's a infinitesimally small chance of having a blood clot. From, so there's all these things yeah. that aren't typical risks. And so at what point do you talk about them? I just feel like if 20% of the population is allergic to nickel, I mean, if you're not using metal clips, it probably doesn't matter. But in this case, we're just talking about foreign bodies, but... Sure, sure. Certainly in the case of metal clips, 20% is a significant portion of the population that may not know to say, hey, I've had a reaction to jewelry. No, for sure. What I was going to kind of wrap that up with is what's interesting is I think even me, I do a decent job. I say that we're going to clip the duct and get it out of there, but I don't say we place clips. And that's just a matter of me thinking that a patient understands what clipping means. And maybe I need to be a little bit more... Um, yeah, probably not, concrete. would be my guess. Yeah. And so you, you think you're informing, and then maybe I'm not. So yeah, I could probably do a better job with that. Although it's funny, because there are patients that want to know everything that you can possibly tell them. And there are patients yeah. that don't want to know anything, right? Yeah. Like, at all. <laughs> like, then we're going to... No, 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 no. I don't want to know. Okay, but we're going to have to... <laughs> I need to tell you this. By law, I have to tell you this. Okay, quickly. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So I think everyone approaches their bodies differently. And I think the, yeah. the key is making sure that a patient understands these things. When a patient has a lot of allergies, I am a little bit more in tune because I think people that have more drug sensitivities and drug allergies, I think they probably are a little bit higher risk. I yeah. don't have proof of that, but I think that's true. So yeah, I think we should probably talk about things that we leave behind. That's a, probably a pretty reasonable thing to do. What do you think can be done to increase the awareness of metal hypersensitivity in the realm of physicians and surgeons? Studies. I mean, yeah, there's no question. Studies that show it works. Okay. Studies that show patients improve. Studies that show that it doesn't harm patients. There's no question about that. That's the only way, right? When the 1980s, Dr. Lichtenstein, who's no longer with us, uh, convinced us all that we needed to use mesh to repair inguinal hernias. Before that, there were several different competing tissue repairs for hernias. Yes. And the recurrence rates were 10 to 20%, give or take. And they were extremely painful. 
And you really kind of only repaired them when they were larger. You wouldn't necessarily repair smaller ones just because the recurrence rate was high. So why do that? And Dr. Lichtenstein, he put in this mesh and everyone thought he was an idiot. Why are you putting in a foreign body? Why are you doing this? Blah, 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 blah. And he took that recurrence rate from one in 10 to one in 3000. And so over several studies that proved that this was the way to go, it took about 10 years and we went from... Yeah, it's something you can do if you want, I guess, to right as I started training, everyone finally said, yeah, if you don't use mesh, you're not practicing standard of care. It became the opposite. Not just, hey, you can use mesh, but no, you should be using mesh. And if you're not, you better have a good reason why you're not. Boy, that's a can of worms. I have some strong mesh opinions, <laughs> but we won't leave that for another day. No, no, no. It's, it's an interesting conversation. In the inguinal space, I don't think there's any doubt that it's the safest and best way to do it. In other sure. spaces, it's controversial and evolving to say the very least. But in the inguinal space, it's very safe. And the recurrence rate's so high there that I think it still makes sense. In other spaces, big, big difference. I think that goes along with stuff you believe as well, but that's truly what I believe. Do you discuss diet and environmental concerns regarding metals in food with metal allergic patients? Or do you even know this is a thing? For example, I was hugely affected when I had clips and staples and hardware with metal in my diet. And anytime I ate those foods, I would have acute allergic reactions from foods that were high in nickel and other metals. Do you even discuss that? Or is that, since you're a surgeon, is that best left to the GP? I don't think it falls into my my purview as much. What I do talk about, if people bring it up, my opinion is that in general, diet and sensitivity to foods is so personal. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you can have someone with gluten sensitivity or gluten allergy. Yeah. And they can manage it in certain different ways depending on where they are. European flour is a little different than American flour. There are differences. So I kind of leave that to them because there's so many different ways to navigate it. And I do not have the background nutritionally to know what's even in my own food that I'm eating. And so while I respect it, I, I certainly say, hey, we can have you talk to a dietitian, or certainly if it doesn't work for you, you need something different. Uh, that's not really my practice. I'm looking at, can we document this in a way that is going to get the procedure covered so that we can help you? The other stuff I'm going to leave to another doctor, really. Could you see a subspecialty in metal allergy in the medical profession? Could you see that happening? Yes, with a tiny little asterisk in that I don't know an individual like I'm just metal allergy. I would worry about that. We've kind of seen this before with other specialties that have cropped up. Uh, like there are Lyme disease doctors, for example. And while I'm sure some of them are doing some good things, there are others that, well, frankly, aren't. And so I always worry about someone that has one focus and I worry that they're just trying to do snake oil. And so they take something that is legitimate, like Lyme disease, and then they start expanding things. So then now they're treating patients that may or may not even have Lyme disease? And are they just taking advantage of patients? Particularly, I very much would caution anyone, if you're seeing someone that is only cash pay, yeah, you know, what are they doing? Why are they only cash pay? I don't know. I can speak a little bit to Lyme disease and that's a whole other episode. I had Lyme because my immune sure. system had such reactivity and I saw several Lyme literate medical doctors. Unfortunately, the medical industry, the insurance industry does not reimburse for Lyme disease. Our understanding of Lyme disease is so nothing that these doctors are getting ostracized and kicked out of medicine for treating Lyme disease. Yeah. So they almost need to be cash pay. I went to a doctor who was a chiropractor that uses muscle testing and energy balancing, literally cured five years of Lyme disease for me in about three visits. So, I mean, those doctors are out there and there's some great sure. ones. We had some in this area in particular that were not doing good things. And so I think that there's different approaches. And you said something different. You said Lyme literate doctor, not necessarily a Lyme disease doctor. There's a phrase there, LLMD, Lyme literate medical doctors. And these are medical doctors who specialize in Lyme as their primary focus. But I'm sure there's good and bad in every industry, right? For sure. I guess I worry about that. I worry if you went that route, the same thing that happened to the Lyme disease people. If we believe that they do good, and are good. But then the problem is they get, they sort of sanctioned themselves into a certain part of the medical community, then it became right. easy to ostracize them. So I think a better approach is if we put out the studies that say, this is an issue, this procedure particularly helps them. And then we just have people that as part of their allergy practice are literate in it and use it. And we have those studies to do that. I think that's probably the better approach to have it more widely accepted and not be something that's fringe 
that has the potential to have stones thrown at it, if that makes sense. Do you think we need metal-free alternatives to implants in the surgical setting? Yeah, I think with clips, I think we've solved it, right? I think the nylon clips are great. Uh, they actually, in some ways, work better. They actually lock. They don't scissor. I think when we develop something that's actually better and is also not something that potentially can cause harm, then that's a no-brainer, right? So right. I think we've solved clips, at least in my opinion. With staples, oh, boy, that's a harder one. That's a bigger can of worms. With bowel resections, when you're talking about the safety of stapling it versus sewing it, it's much safer to staple it. And so how do you deal with that? Sewing an anastomosis, it's a lot more potential for user error. You also lose a lot of people that might be able to do something robotically or laparoscopically that now can't because they, they don't have the ability or technique to sew something like that. So that's a little bit bigger of a can of worms. And until there's a viable alternative there, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I wonder if you could dip them in carbon fiber. I know with like cardiac stents, they're starting to use these. Is it drug eluting stents? Is that the right word? Yeah, they're starting that's to right. use yeah. those to kind of camouflage the, the metal from the body. And I think it's working in some instances. Yeah, yeah. The drug eluting stents are great. And I'm not a cardiac. Drug eluting so. staples? <laughs> well, so the problem is the reaction that you'd be trying to prevent actually would prevent it from healing. And I think your leak rate would go up, right? So you could have like steroids yeah. around or something like that. And then, then the bowel that you're trying to heal wouldn't heal. So like, oh, what do we do with that? Likewise, people undergoing bariatric surgery, a sleeve procedure would be virtually impossible without a stapler. So once somebody has bariatric surgery, once it's healed, can those clips and staples be undone from a prior bariatric surgery? It'd be hard. It'd be real hard. From a sleeve perspective, yeah, you would have to excise the sleeve staple line and then re-sew it. Yeah. I mean, that'd be a Benefit long time. versus risk, right? Yeah, that'd be a long conversation about risk. I've been successful in people that have had appendectomies and getting those clips and staples off, but then I still just overstowed where the appendix was. But you're talking about a tiny little four or five millimeter defect. You're talking about with the stomach, like it's almost a foot uh, or longer, and taking those staples out and then sewing it, I think would be pretty high risk. That being said, in the right patient, it might be worth it. Right. Is it appropriate to address metal allergies in the surgical timeout? In the surgical timeout? No, I think pre-op's the better place to do that. Two answers here, right? Surgical timeouts became a thing. They were just starting as I started training in residency. And yep. the initial thought was, this makes a ton of sense, right? Yep. Right patient, right procedure, correct side. Those were kind of the only three that we talked about. And right. that helps a lot. Okay, we're going to stop. We're going to take a quick, literally, timeout where no one does anything, and we're going to confirm that this patient, Jane Doe, is having a left, everyone agree, left, 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 inguinal hernia repair. Okay. Yes, we all agree. Wonderful. That's what the consent says. That's what she signed. That's how it's booked. All good. And then it became like, okay, no, let's add stuff. Okay. And then for a while, it was like, okay, now we need to add antibiotics. Okay. So we need to see, does this patient need antibiotics based on the surgery? Okay. And it got to the point that for a while, there was one hospital where the surgical timeout became 20 steps. And when you are literally are starting to ask questions that are only rarely important, then the importance of the actual timeout and what it's trying to accomplish loses it. So you get too much information, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if I'm going to stop and do three quick things to make sure this patient is safe, I'm going to stop and do that. If we're going to stop and you're going to read this list of 20 things that only four are, patient, are important to this patient, yeah. then we have to look at, are we doing good? And can we address this in a different way? We have the same problem when we do computer entry of orders. Any drug that's written for that causes a reaction to any drug the patient's ever been on gets popped up as a warning. Sometimes that's hugely important. Well, as it turns out, there's some post-operative things that we give that have an interaction with drugs used during surgery. And so when I write orders, those conflict, but they're not going to be given at the same time, but the computer has no way to know that. So I get a warning with every single post-operative patient, literally every single one. So after a while, do you really pay attention to that warning? Right. So I, I think the answer is, yeah, I think it's a good idea to address it. When and how is the question. 
And so I've, I've opened up a larger can of worms of, yeah, I think it's a good yeah. idea to address. It. I really do. In the operative timeout, probably not because that thing gets too long anyway. What can the patient do in pre-op in regards to the surgical consent to make sure no foreign bodies are placed? Ask. That's a great question. If you have a concern and you already know you have a history or say you have a family history and you think you're at risk or you just don't want them, make sure it's known, right? Right. Uh, oh, is this, is this a procedure where I can have clips? And the nurse who's taking care of you to do the pre-op may not know, but the surgeon should know. I think the other thing is if it's important to you, be prepared to cancel if the surgeon doesn't agree to not. Well, and I'm aware of one patient. It was a spine surgery patient, for example, and we don't know where the miscommunication happened. He went out for a revision for metal allergies on a lumbar fusion. They redid it when the vascular surgeon turned him around and approached from the anterior. They put 17 clips in. He's there for a metal allergy. Where was the miscommunication? Do you have a guess as to where that might have been? So he was having what done again? A revision right. for a spinal fusion, proven allergic to titanium, out there to have it revised with stainless steel. It was a 365 fusion. When they did the surgeon, the, the vascular surgeons who does the anterior approach, I guess, and he put 17 clips in. Yeah. It the, was there for a metal allergy. The spine surgeon didn't talk to the vascular surgeon. That's the answer. Spine exposure surgeons may or may not be super involved with the preoperative process. So if you're having a spine surgery done, you see the spine surgeon and you, in terms of the person that's going to do the the access and, and all that stuff, that may or may not. Um, so, yeah. For, so for that reason, for a known metal allergy, would addressing that particular patient in the surgical timeout have alleviated that? Yeah, no question. But in that setting, I would argue that is on the consent, right? So the, there's a couple of different things on the consent, patient name, surgeon, diagnosis, procedure. Right. Yep. I think when you're saying like literally the diagnosis is metal allergy and then the procedure is remove titanium, replace with stainless steel, I think that's part of the timeout that makes sense for that patient. That's how that, in my opinion, should be addressed, particularly right. when the if the patient is literally there. Now, that being said... I'm assuming when he lists his allergies, right? If he's saying, you know, penicillin or whatever that he's allergic to, he also includes titanium, yes? Yeah, I would hope. I wasn't there for so, that patient, but I would think he would. I mean, that's the reason yeah, he's there. So that would be the other thing is if he didn't say that, then that could be, a, not on him, don't get me wrong, but you can see that being dropped, right? Because if he had sure. titanium listed as an allergy, theoretically, there are three different people in the operating room that should be aware of that to help prevent that. The, the circulating nurse, as well as the, the scrub tech, sometimes scrub nurse, yep. as well as the surgeon themselves to say like, oh wait, titanium allergy, what? And yeah. one of the things that may or may not have been done during that case is typically when a new surgeon comes in, right? So if there's two parts to the procedure where, you know, I do something and then let's say, and this happens with me with OBGYN with some frequency where, you know, they yeah. do something, let's say they do a hysterectomy and then I do a hernia repair or something like that. When the new surgeon starts, they stop and redo the timeout. And so that may be a setting where that could have been addressed. Mm, got it. So you've already said that you don't fear backlash, but the more direct question is, do you fear any backlash from the FDA or the medical industry regarding your willingness to remove clips or staples or for other doctors who may be willing to do that? I'm old enough. I just don't care. <laughs> it, my, my job is to help people. So many things that we do are a little bit by accident, right? So we talked about that I do reflux surgery. I got into reflux surgery because I, I liked it. I, I trained to do it. Um, and then when I started with the group that I started with in Dallas back in 2005, no one in that group liked the reflux surgery at all. They just hated it. For whatever reason, they didn't like doing that surgery. And I was like, mm, I'll do it. Okay, fine. So literally what has become a big part of my life's work is because three other people didn't like it. Right. And, and so, yeah, in a similar way, this has sort of fallen to me where a surgeon that I respect asked me a question. I answered them. They asked if I'd be willing to see patients. I saw patients and then had a overwhelmingly positive experience. So until someone were to show me why we're not going to affect good outcomes, then I'm just going to continue to do it, right? With surgery, it's a little bit different, right? There's foreign bodies that are placed. Foreign bodies can cause pain. People leave sponges behind occasionally, right? That's why we do surgical counts. Insurance covers those coming out. That's why there's a code for removal of foreign body. Every single clip that is placed is a foreign body. 
So that's why I think we haven't had trouble with insurance at this point. And while, yeah, you may have some surgeons that sort of don't love it, I understand why they don't. But at the yes. same time, like, I don't have a ton of fear about it, at least not until I should, I guess. Right. Um, well, and, you know, the outcomes have been great. And so I think if you were to have an outcome that wasn't as great, that might give you pause for yeah. sure. Doing surgery can be risky. And so when you have a bad outcome, that always does give you pause. Should I be doing this? Is this the right thing? We beat ourselves what? up a lot about this stuff. We're down to our last couple of questions. What no advice worries. would you give a metal allergic patient in another state? It'll be somewhat self-serving. Number one, we offer televisits, right? So, <laughs> self no, I mean, go ahead. If nothing else, then they can have someone listen to them, right? And I've had patients that did that and then didn't have surgery. They saw me and they were seeing me like for a second opinion. And then they had another surgeon that had told them this or that. And they had planned to go back to that surgeon. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened with that. But I think some local research in terms of, is there a surgeon willing to do this? The problem is it's not like you can just go on the internet and find that. Even me, I'm, I'm a believer, if you will, or I, I believe in this as being an effective thing to do. But at the same time, I have been a little reluctant to just open up the floodgates because yeah. I don't know who's out there. And I don't want to take advantage of people. I don't want to be that guy that says, oh, you have staples and you hurt. Clearly, it's your staples. And now we're going to get those out. And yeah, I think if you do that, you run the risk of actually hurting people. And sure. I think it's important to listen to the stories and, and that kind of thing. And so as long as I can do that, I'm comfortable. If I ever get to the point where I can't do that, I won't be as comfortable. Try and find someone that's willing to do it. Otherwise, I'm happy to see you. Would you be willing to consult with a surgeon in another state? If the surgeon was game to do it, but has never done it before, would you sure. consult with that surgeon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way that would work is, and I've done this too, actually, with other things. Because of the reflux work I do, I get surgeons that will call me and say, hey, what do you do with this? Oh. What do you think of this? And is this something you should do? And if a surgeon want to talk to me about my experience, and yeah, I'd be happy to. Would this be worthwhile as a continuing education credit for a physician or surgeon, especially those in robotic surgery, which sounds like is much more friendly to this? this yeah, time? for sure. That'd be pretty straightforward. I think initially, if I put out a course that said, uh, here's how you take out clips, I, I think what most surgeons would think is, uh, yeah, I know how to take them out. You shouldn't. <laughs> I think it's the sort of the response I get. I think the more important thing is educating medical doctors and allergist that this is a potential problem and how to effectively test for it and identify the patients that might benefit from this and help us. Because in general, surgeons are we're good technicians. I like to think I'm a good listener. I am not someone who is going to think about every single pathway in allergic medicine or the things that medical doctors think of. I just not where my brain is. And yeah. so getting those people to understand and give us a better starting point of like referral base. I think that's where the education can happen. And that's where maybe the studies can help. Do doctors know where to send patients for metal allergy testing? I think no. you probably do, but uh, now, yeah. yeah, no, I made phone calls before and you know, they all just be like, uh, what, you know, huh? <laughs> I don't want to advertise them because I'm not hundred percent on them to be completely honest, sure. but at the same time, yeah, we've got a pathway that we can at least utilize but in terms of allergists and things like that, I don't know. They like skin tests and allergy drops. So uh, in my experience, patch testing puts the patient who's already having systemic th symptoms through a whole lot more systemic symptoms. So I'm a big fan yes. of the blood LTT test, but that's just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So here is the million dollar question. You're willing to remove clips and staples. Were you a believer then? And are you a believer now? Believer now? Yes. In the right patient, I think hopefully I, my message has been clear about that. Just because you have yes. clips and you have pain doesn't always mean that's the case. But at the same time, when I first did it, I was unsure. I think that's fair. I don't think I was an unbelief, non I wasn't a non believer, but I wouldn't say I was like a believer either. I think it's just the experience of the patients. I think anything that we do that's relatively new, you got to be not afraid to take that first step. And yeah. I think as long as you're not going to hurt someone, those first steps are important. And if you do them safely, I think it's still okay to do something that's maybe not as traditional and might be something different that if it helps someone, amazing. To reiterate what you said earlier, in the majority of patients you've done, I don't know if you want to assign it a percentage, you have seen systemic symptoms improve and health improve overall since removing clips and staples. I think if you went and pulled my patients, you'd have... One patient that is happy that he got it done, but it didn't work. I think you have another patient that it just didn't work. I don't know how she feels about overall. 
Mm-hmm. I think she's probably still happy she got it done, but yeah, I don't know how happy she is. But that being said, everyone else has been just over the moon in terms of how they felt. That includes one lady that had a little bit of a post-operative thing where she had to come back in because she was vomiting and it all got better and nothing bad happened, but she didn't have the smoothest course ever. Yeah. But yeah, she did great. Well, it took me six months to notice any benefit from having my gallbladder flips removed, but at six months, the benefit was undeniable. My experience has been better than that. My experience has literally yeah. been most patients feel better within a week. At oh least yeah. Well, most. I have a body full of metal and most people don't. So the little clips yeah. coming out of my body full of metal, it's going to take me longer to respond. Fair, fair, fair. But when you're talking about isolated clips, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Been, it's been dramatic. And so, yeah, I would say that I'm full in, but at the same time, I'm careful. And I think that yeah. I don't want to be the guy that just removes clips regardless of whether or not I think it's going to help. Okay. Last question. And then a surprise question. <laughs> oh, God. Surprise question first. Can we see your tattoo? What is it? It just says October 1st, 2020, never again. What happened? Actually, I've talked about it. It's a uh, health scary hat. I have uh, type 2 diabetes and I ended up in the ICU. And oh, wow. after that, I lost a ton of weight and got much healthier, work out. So that is That's actually- a reminder. My, yeah, it's also my wall there. So it's just a reminder to not eat like crap and exercise. And that is the struggle for all of us, isn't it? Uh, Okay. Last question. What is your favorite heavy metal band and your favorite heavy metal song? Because this is the Heavily Metal Podcast. Yeah, yeah. Heavy metal. The the Desert Island CD is Appetite for Destruction with Guns N' Roses. Uh, No question about it. I guess there's some people that would say that Guns N' Roses is not necessarily heavy metal, but I'm going to put there. Oh, yes, they are. And then uh, most of my favorite... I'd have to go with Mr. Brownstone. Okay. Mr. Brownstone or, and it, it's not really a heavy metal song, but I really like Patience too, both by Guns N' Roses. Patience is on Guns N' Roses Lies, though. That's a heavy metal song. It's a metal ballad, right? Okay, so here's a funny story. Every now and then, when it's appropriate, I'll tell a funny story. I don't know if you know this, but I used to work in the music business with all the 80s hair metal bands. Okay. So my very first job in 1986, somewhere near at 1986, Troubadour, Big Rock Club in Hollywood, California, I know. and Guns N' Roses had just, I don't know if they had signed or they were just about to be signed to their record deal, but they in were 86, playing at the, just about. Yeah, they were playing at the Troubadour. So my timeline is right. The brain fog's not impeding me. So yeah. Axel and the band came in to do their sound check for the show that night at the Troubadour. And there was, I think it was an Italian restaurant. There was a restaurant next door and there were these decorative plates on the wall. And we couldn't turn on the bass bins, which is basically the big bass subwoofers during the time that they had dining open at the restaurant next door because the plates would fall off the wall. (laughs) And Axel got so furious at me that I almost lost my job. (laughs) So you had a fight with Axel Rose? Oh, yeah. Big fight. Big fight with Axel Rose. So did the rest of the band. So, yeah. Well, (laughs) sorry, Axel. I still love you, but that was the thing. (laughs) No, okay, no, no. well, I'm funny, gonna... but just interesting because that restaurant actually made it to November Rain. The video is loosely based on that restaurant, probably because they were. Oh, really? I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you remember the video at all, they literally are right next to, uh, like, kind of when they're, they're up and I was coming. Drunk then. <laughs> anyway, so very cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. That's... I used to pick Slash up drunk and take him home off the sidewalk outside the Cat Club. On a regular basis, I have picked up Slash from the road more times than one. According to his biography, he and Axel were living in a storage shed at that time. I didn't even know that. Yes. Wow. I should go read some of these bios. I was there, but I didn't see all of that. Thank you so, so much for coming on and spending so much time. But man, all these metal allergic patients have so many questions regarding this. So you have just been a wealth of knowledge and I am super, super grateful. Is there anything we didn't cover that you want to cover in wrapping up? No, I think, yeah, I think my message is that this is something that is out there. I think it's something that there are patients can definitely benefit. This is overall medical advice. Just be careful putting all your hope in one basket and be very wary of people that are trying to sell you a cure. Right. Just be very wary of that. I think that is the danger that we run into. And I think that's one of the reasons that we talked about the Lyme disease doctors have gotten a little bit of a bad rap because that's at least the perception. It may not be reality, but that's the perception. Yeah. And so don't get taken advantage of, be careful and be very careful from someone that just wants cash up front. All good advice. Dr. Cottrell, thank you very much. Sure, sure. <laughs> super, super grateful. And I 
welcome you to this community. We all end on the same note every episode, and that is we want to change the medical narrative surrounding metal allergies and to tell the medical community that we don't like being gaslit and we're not going to take it anymore. Twisted sister, I like it. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in today. Please don't forget to follow me on social media and to like, share, and subscribe. My primary mission is reaching out to others who may be suffering from hypersensitivity reactions to metal implants and pointing them to resources that can assist with hope, help, and healing. If you know someone that suffers from a chronic illness, you might ask if they have any implanted metal hardware and if they've ever had a reaction to jewelry or metals of any kind. Might not even be on their radar. Visit us at heavilymetal.com where you can find images and documentation relating to our show today, as well as a number of valuable resources and links to assist you on your own personal healing journey. Until next time, keep on rocking.